When I made it to my home place, I found triumph of the will. Where once lay a shining city, stood a fortress on a hill. This is Fortress on a Hill with Henry, Danny, Kagan, Giovanni, Shiloh, and Manisha. Welcome, everyone, to Fortress on the Hill, a podcast about U.S. foreign policy, anti-imperialism, skepticism, and the American way of life. I'm Giovanni, here with Shiloh. Thank you for being with us today. How are you doing, Shiloh? I'm wonderful. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Yeah. Awesome. Shiloh, the Israeli-American genocidal war against Palestinians, the Palestinian War of Liberation has been raging on for 268 days or nine months with no end in sight. Despite the unlimited amount of munition and political cover given to Israel by the United States and other Western countries, such as the UK, France, and Germany, the Israeli occupation force is no closer to victory than they were on October 8th against the various Palestinian factions leading the resistance. What they can achieve on the battlefield, they take it on as civilians and unnecessary destruction of infrastructure. Despite being an unpopular venture in the United States, the Biden administration doesn't seem to budge to the demands of his party's constituents demanding a ceasefire. Instead, the president doubles down in the support of the state of Israel with billions of dollars continue to flow to fund this genocide war. In the United States, students have decided not to take this with crossed arms and instead have taken up the task to lead student protests at the level perhaps not seen since the Vietnam War or the Vietnam era. On April 17, 2024, students from Columbia University started a national movement by pitching tents and camping out on the, on school campuses, the school campus. This created a ripple effect where more than 100 campus encampments were erected across the United States. They raised critical demands about ending war and genocide in Gaza, calling for universities to diverse from military and weapons manufacturing companies, financial transparency, and free expression. Here to tell us more, we have two guests. Rogue is a political artist and activist in the city of Detroit. Uh, they are affiliated with Anarchist Artist Collective based in Detroit that is focused on queer liberation. Rogue was a participant in the WSU encampment as an autonomous person. And Levy is a student at the University of Michigan and Air Force veteran and a Quaker. Levy is involved with the Divestment Coalition at the university, the T-A-H-R-I-R Coalition. Levy was a participant at the UM encampment from April until the 21st of May. How are you guys doing? Welcome to the show. Doing well. Thank you. Good to be here. Levy, what is T-A-H-R-I-R? What does that stand for? Yeah, it's, it stands for, I forget what all the letters stand for, but Tahir in Arabic means liberation. And right. each of the letters are in the vein of that, and what the Divestment Coalition stands for. Okay, Tahir. Awesome. Welcome to the show. Let's start with Levi. Levi, you and your cohort st set up an encampment in late April that ran for 30 days until the 21st of May. Uh, you guys were raided the university by state police in the middle of worship service. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. We had actually had some talk about an encampment before Columbia started theirs just because there's been encampment in past protest movement, uh, particularly at the University of Michigan. In the movement against apartheid in South Africa, uh, shanty towns were set up to show people what people were living through in South Africa. And they were left up for, I, I think, months, maybe over a year or two on it. Like it was a very long term protest. And so that was something that we had in mind. There had been talks about it. But when Columbia did theirs and Nash SJP put out the call to say, hey, anybody who has the capacity to do this, 
see if you can put this together. We took that seriously and, and ran with it. When we started, to be honest with you, I thought that police would clear us within hours, within days, that kind of thing. I had no idea that the political systems in the region would uh, really let us stay out there that long. They really um, resisted clearing us. I think that they they didn't want to look like all these other schools. The University of Michigan is like in Ann Arbor, which is a very liberal town. And they had a lot of different motivations. City council was keeping Ann Arbor Police Department from getting involved. And so that helped us out as well, because when it finally came down to it, they had to pull in police department, like the university police department, but also Michigan State Police to do the clearing of the encampment without Ann Arbor Police Department. There's a lot going on, a lot of reasons that they didn't clear us for so long, but I was really glad that we were able to make it 30 days and keep it there and keep this community thriving. We couldn't have done it without so many people from the community supporting us, supporting us financially, supporting us with their labor and time and people coming in and just being in the space to keep it safe. And it was one of the coolest things I've been a part of in my life, like just to be there and be with other people and be in an interfaith community, uh, a community with people of all different kinds of backgrounds, a learning community. We were having teach-ins on the dyad right next to where teach-ins were founded in the United States. It was a real cool experience. How was the, uh, the administration taking this? Because I know that we saw the, uh, in Columbus, for example, the administration in Columbus University, they were like leading the whole crackdown on the students. How was the administration where they're taking it? Very poorly. They've responded to it, essentially mocking us at every turn. The president of our university has stated repeatedly that he loves Israel. He supports them unconditionally. He has been to Israel and he knows exactly what's going on and he knows exactly what they're doing and he supports it fully. And I meet students every day that have no idea that this guy has been to Israel and completely supports it. And then our regents, we have eight regions and they control the endowment. So they've been who we've targeted with our messages and our campaign to say, Hey, these people hold the keys to divestment. So we have to get at them to get them to take it seriously. And that's been impossible. Even the democratic so-called progressive regions, they mock us and delegitimize us and state very clearly that they will not listen to us. They will not divest. Uh, they say that they will shield the endowment from political pressures which is silly because the university divested from South Africa, from tobacco. They are on a plan to divest from fossil fuel, which obviously they should just do immediately. And then they even divested from Russia the moment that war broke out there. So they clearly, it clearly is a political thing. And we know those leftists, money is inherently political. This whole thing is political. And so to say that you'll shield a financial endowment that's invested in real things that affect real people. To say that you'll shield that from political political pressure is like you know, saying that you'll shield a political thing from political pressure. It's just a silly thing to say. Yeah. I'm curious what a lot of the universities had very specific demands. Did y'all, did UMIC follow the demands of many other universities? Did you have special ones specific to UMIC or, yeah, that's for either Rogue or Levi? Sure. I know that our demands, we tried to keep them pretty simple. We just had four. Divest from Israeli apartheid and genocide. Establish a people's audit. So a committee that would be positioned to be able to have control or at least to make statements and have some kind of advisory role in regards to the endowment because it's a large sum of money. Um, and then boycott Israeli academic institutions was our third demand. And then abolish campus policing, um, which went in line with older demands and the fact that DPSS, which is our, 
our the security wing at the university of incredibly racist, evil origins. And so that was important to us to include in our list of demands. Wayne State had very similar demands. One thing that the SJP at Wayne State was really demanding that became a game at point at some points was they were demanding a meeting with President SB due to President SB continuously sending out an email pretty much every day that she that she had Vice President Lindsay come by and talk to the encampment. An edited video would get sent out along with a nine paragraph email about why what we were doing was wrong. And then there would be false promises made of the we'll meet with you then, and then it suddenly wouldn't materialize, or they would suddenly find the ability to hold a very impromptu meeting without giving any of the SJP members a chance to really organize for it. That was a continuous use by the administration. That and the fire marshal, they really wanted an excuse. They found, they tried to make it you, Mitch which was a continuous back and forth with myself and the fire marshal a lot of times because I was still walking through and having an argument with him then on camera about it and correcting them. Ro, you say that on, you told me that on May 30, the, uh, the university police launched a raid against your encampment early in the morning? Yeah, so they got a 5, like 30-ish raid time on us. We had thought there was going to be a raid the evening before. We stuck, I stuck around out there for a little while. Then I went, ended up going home that evening. And I got a call from some of my friends who were out there that at around 530, they had shown up and made an issuance of a clearance demand on us. And then shortly after the clearance demand was made by Wayne State Police, they began the process of breaking through our barricades. And they went through a really targeted arrest system, they ignored a lot of campers and they went for anyone that they really felt was in any sort of leadership. They got our kitchen guy. He was one of the first people they snagged as soon as they walked in. They got a friend of mine that was really active and setting up the camp and everything else along with almost all the SJP leaders. You said also they, they targeted specifically women, Muslim women. Hijabi women's. Yeah. Uh, so several of us attempted to march back to the camp. And when that occurred, they, they got a little bit of around behind the group and broke into the group forcefully. There was like an attempt by one of the officers to grab me. And then he lost interest in me and immediately went to an SJP member who they ended up removing her hijab while she was on the ground along with her mother and I believe her aunt also had their observed in broad public. The vileness never ceases to yeah. amaze me. Yeah, um, Queen State still hasn't acknowledged it. They haven't called for, they have publicly called for an investigation to the removal of the jobs. They haven't talked about it at all. I think the only thing they've said is we'll review the body cam footage. Hmm. Tell us a little bit how your, in your school, how was this encampment started? How did you guys launched it and what was the reaction of the administration? Our chapter out here launched it. They called me in day of to come play street medic for them and to help out there. And they did it really beautifully. They had a really big distraction that occurred with a circular march. And then they just started dropping tents while that was going on. And it took the cops a little bit of time really to respond to us. Several members got out there. They got fencing really quickly. They grabbed pretty much, if it wasn't nailed down in the first 12 hours, it was getting dragged to our walls, which then became the thing for a lot of us that were there to help out was building those walls and just making it more difficult to take it. And the cops had a really hard time dealing with us initially. We had a motorcycle cop that the first night circled around the encampment the entire evening and revving his engine like every time he came up by tents. They brought out a tactical vehicle within like the first three minutes of us being out there. As soon as the sun started coming down, there was a tactical vehicle coming up to just park and walk the encampment. 
Mm. Um, and that was there for several days. Um, several members got together to start the process of trying to block their view and deny them visibility and access to the camp at that point. I'm curious if any of the demands y'all both listed, the very simple, direct, clear demands, were any of those demands reached? Were any of them? Not a single point that demands had been met to date. We got admonished by our Board of Governors member, Brian Barnhill, at the last Board of Governors meeting, telling us to use critical thinking to see that divestment wouldn't change anything. And that was rather interesting three minutes spiel from him. And who was this again? It was Governor Bar it was Board of Governors member Brian Barnhill. At the very end of the meeting, at the last Board of Governors meeting, which we were supposed to be able to have dialogue, actually, they had promised us during the encampment that there was going to be an opportunity for dialogue with the Board of Governors regarding divestment mm -hmm. during the comment. And then they moved public comment to the end. After they went to go close it, he objected to it so that he could say a three minute piece, essentially just talking very paternally to the student body that was requesting divestment. At one point, telling us to use critical thinking skills. And it was just a very interesting tirade from him. So, what were you supposed to do with critical thinking? Me is that I think we're just going to start trying to look for people. To... That was my takeaway from me. Miss tirade, honestly. Wow. And uh, how about you, Levi? Were any of the demands reached or were there any discussions started around them between the administration? At all. Yeah, we've been at it for quite a while at the University of Michigan. There's been a STP chapter here for many years and around since October. SGP and Jewish Voice for Peace have been at the forefront of the divestment coalition, getting more organizations involved in that. So it's been a big effort. Our university was one of those that had a whole lot going on for divestment long before the encampment started. And so they were poised very clearly to just say, no, yeah. yet again, no. Um, and I think that points to the fact that we have to make it impossible for them. We have to make it uncomfortable for them, right? Um, nobody convinced the Dutch that what they were doing in South Africa was morally reprehensible and that they could stop because of that. They made it politically and economically uncomfortable for them until they just kind of keep doing it. And if we really believe that what these people are doing is wrong, if we really believe that they're aiding a genocide, then it makes absolutely, it makes a lot of sense to just make their lives incredibly uncomfortable until they divest. Yeah, I have to say, we might hit it on the nail on the head. I mean, it just has to be completely uncomfortable for these regions and these Board of Governors members to conduct business as usual. Uh, and that's really going to be key on college campuses to divestment. I think that the more we see student activism making it harder for them to conduct business as usual, the more successful it's going to be long term. What do you, what do you, these national protests that's going on, what, do you see a, a chink on the armor? Do you see uh, anything shifting with these, with these protests happening around, uh, around the country? Absolutely. I really do. And I see it happening in many ways. I think that, of course, there are on college campuses, a lot of the impact that you're going to see is in the younger generation, but you're seeing that even in young people who are not involved that have maybe stopped by the encampment once or twice, they without question understand that what Israel is doing is wrong. And they understand a whole lot more about Zionism than past generations of Americans did. So that's powerful. It's particularly powerful when we're talking about young Jewish people and Jewish students at these universities that are leading the protests, getting involved in them, learning more. We're talking you know, some people that were raised by Zionist parents, uh, many people involved that were raised by anti-Zionist parents, and some people involved that, that were really on the fence before. And I think that's where a lot of the, I think that terrifies the conservative Jewish establishment and it terrifies 
the, these Zionist universities because they see that you've got a bunch of Jewish students involved in the protests and then maybe just a few counter protesting. And of course, not all of the people that disagree with us and are Jewish are going to show up with an Israeli flag, but plenty do. And it just goes to show that the people that feel really passionately about them, about this issue, there's a very strong group that is on the side for Palestine. And so that really tells you something about why they have put so much money into universities, because it is really about controlling the message. Israel has lasted this long by convincing people that it is a progressive ethnic cleansing, that it's progressive apartheid, that it's a progressive ethnostate. And the only way that we'll demolish it is by showing people what a lie that is. And particularly considering the impact of the Jewish left on the world, that's particularly important in the Jewish community. And that's something that we're seeing at these college camps. What's your take on it, Rob? We had, Wayne State doesn't have the strongest JVP voice mm -hmm. out there, but we did get a lot of support from you, Mitch's JVP who had members regularly coming out to help support and help fight. And then we also had the Detroit Jewish for Peace that was out there engaging pretty much daily, hitting the university as much as they could with the demands of the encampment. Mm -hmm. I do think that it is shifting things. We didn't have nearly as many counter protesters as I expected because Hillel is a rather large presence on our campus. They control half of the sixth floor of the student center and they have a pretty impressive budget, but they didn't really show up. We had one, one counter protester showed up the very first day for prayer to stand around and act intimidating. He wandered off after about 20 minutes of the staring contest. But I do agree. Levi is correct. I think that the coalition is stronger than it's ever been. It's growing. Wayne State's coalition is growing rapidly particularly around the Detroit metro area, we're seeing more groups sign on and joining up and fighting back against it. And just in the discussion around like coalitions and really diverse group of peoples like coming together, like what each of you, what were some of, what some of the beauty that you witnessed and were a part of in this solidarity encampments and then on the counter, like what was some of the, the pain that you also witnessed amongst all the just different. I'll start. One thing that really happened at Wayne State's encampment is that our student body had previously been not quite connected, particularly between our queer student body and SJP. We just hadn't really, we supported them. We just never really engaged with them directly very often. The encampment definitely changed that and it definitely forged a much stronger student coalition on Wayne State's campus as we dealt with the university and its flashback, mm -hmm. uh, along with it attempting to pink wash during our encampment. Um, they tried to open a show and then ended up having to cancel it due to the encampment, which was nice. And that was a queer, that was a mighty real queer trait show that they attempted to open at the Elaine Jacobs, which my activist group. My collective called for a boycott and it was joined by several campus groups for that. And then it ended up getting canceled and shoved around. I think it had a very weak opening overall. But yeah, we're seeing much stronger state coalitions come out of it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, there is. And we've seen the, we've seen that it's working. We've seen that it's working, what's happening across the nation because the, the, uh, the images are, the images coming from Palestine. Is reaching everyone, anyone with the, anyone with the computer, anyone with the iPhone, anyone with, the, with with social media. You can see the images. This is the this is the first genocide in history happening in real time, where everybody's knowing, everybody can see what is happening. And not only this is affect, not only this is obviously affecting negatively the uh, the Palestinian people, but it's also affecting Israel. Israel. Like you said, Levi, that before the narrative that Israel had to keep her up, to prop her up, is falling apart like a house of cards. Uh, but not only that is happening, but also the United States is falling apart. The narrative 
of the United States of this force for good, the democracy promotion, stepping in, whatever narrative that it uses to justify any type of action around the world is also falling apart too, because now the world is seeing that the hypocrisy of, of U.S. foreign policy, whereas for one ex state, you want to bring the hammer down. We're not going to tolerate this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for, for ex state, but for Israel, it does, it just bends over backwards to cover, to provide cover, political shielding of any criticism. Not only that, it attacks anyone who attacks Israel. For example, where the ICJ, the ICJ brought charges on, on Israel for genocide, et cetera, right? The United States re responded with sanctions on the judges. And <laughs> you've you seen here in Texas, for example, they passed a legislation where pretty much criticizing Israel is akin to anti-Semitism, the governor here, any institution, any public institution that permits that, that permits criticism of Israel, pretty much is open to, for sanction by the state. So we've seen the reaction that's happening, this dystopian, draconian reaction that's happening to shield this one particular state, a state, a very small state, probably the size of New Jersey, which is a small population, which it blows the mind for anyone. But yeah, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, it is particularly unsettling to see this anti-Zionism equals anti-Semitism kind of scenario be codified across the country. And it is, it's worth thinking about that these are states that have leaders that didn't say a thing about the anti-Semitism on the far in Charlottesville or, or any other place. Like they, it's clearly not a really big concern for them, but criticizing Israel is, and they've been given the go ahead by conservative Jewish organizations like the ADL to define anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism, um, which for them means defining anti-imperialism as anti-Semitism. And so yeah. it's a huge issue that we need to stand against and the free speech issue and uh, Israel continue, continuing to be a bully to the United States and its citizens through its lobby in the United States. And so that's, it's ridiculous, but on the heartening side, the more that Jewish people come out in support of Palestine and the more that people discuss this, the more that there's, the more clear it is that our leaders only care about having the back of imperialism, about like propping up imperialism and United States imperialism, wherever it is, the more that distinction between Zionism and Judaism is made clear by Jewish people and by people doing their research, the more that helps people to see that this isn't a Jewish issue, this is an imperialism issue. And I think that that's huge because many progressives are rightly concerned about anti-Semitism. And I know for me personally, before February, I had a block in my mind where I would think about Palestine and I would resist it so strongly. I would see news articles about it and I wouldn't click and I just... I really tried to stay out of it. And so now I'm trying to talk to friends that I know that I feel are in a similar situation, just wanting to stay out of it because they're concerned about getting into something like that. And they believe this idea, oh, it's just too complicated for me. And I think it's totally fair when other people have a lot of blame and feel frustrated with those people. But I feel like I don't, I'm not entitled to that because I was there. And so I try to approach those people with understanding and say, here's what helped me get involved. Try to help them get involved too. And I guess along those lines, Rogue, what would you say for all veterans here and anti-war, anti-imperialist veterans? What would you say to a veteran who's on the fence right now about speaking up? Or... Uh, actually, I would tell any veteran that on the fence about it is that 
they really need to sit down and reflect on the oath they swore and what those things really mean at the end of the day for us as human beings. Our community is here. Yes, and speak to the active duty as well here. We all swore an oath to take care of ourselves here. We all swore an oath to take care of our fellow man in this country to face all those enemies foreign and domestic. And when we look at what imperialism and what American imperialism is doing just here in the United States, I'm maybe, what, 45 minutes away from Southfield right now, Levi? Which with Novi makes the weapons manufacturing corridor in Michigan and any type of weapon that you can think of is out here. And it's giant money. As veterans, we have to get in the streets. We have to get in the streets. We have to stand at the forefront of this and really argue that this is not in our interest. This is not in our national interest. If you're a statist, obviously, if you're an anarchist, you're about liberation of all. So you definitely should be out there anyways. But that's really where this comes down to is that we've all sworn an oath and we can see that American imperialism is not working. It hasn't been working except for a very select elite view. And we're seeing the issues from Israel and how it goes about it and its policing coming back into our streets today, tying it into Wayne State's encampment. Our police chief, Holt, is Israeli trained. He went over there a couple of years ago and went through all that training. And we're seeing those things come back and be used against student protesters now. We're seeing militarized tactics and militarized gear being intentionally used against us. And as veterans, we have to stand up and say, not, nah, that's not okay. That's not how this is going to go. And you're not going to run a tactical vehicle on college campuses because it's just fucking wrong. You don't need to be out there with your baton and your nightstick and everything else trying to intimidate your student body because it's just fucking wrong. And active duty has to stand up and look at that as well and decide this is really what they want to be defending, whether they want to be defending the people at home who aren't here. So that's where I stand at on that. Right. Absolutely. Did you have a question, Giovanni? I was going to check. Oh, no. Go ahead, son. So I have one, I have two last questions, one for each of you and then one for Levi. So the, yes, I spent a while since I've been in college, like a long while, but I assume y'all are on summer break now. And I think that the administrations were hoping that things would fizzle out over summer breaks. The, and I'm curious, not to divulge information or whatever, but what's the plan for when the fall semester starts? Do you, what do you picture happening? Do you think that the student encampments are going to spring back up? Do you, yeah, what, what do you hope will happen? And what do you think is realistic around what might happen? I think that what we're probably going to see is we're going to see a lot. We're seeing some that happen at Wayne State now. We're going to see a lot of hit and run graffiti campaigning. That's going to be drawing a lot of attention, that it was just going to live on social media for a little while. The W at Wayne State just had red splatter all over it. And then they got the video of them cleaning it off, too. There's large format stickers that have been popping up uh, and taking over our building names at Wayne State's campus. I think we're going to see a lot of that type of propaganda play at the moment. Uh, currently, I don't think and this is unless we have a huge push of people um i don't think we're going to see encampments spring back up in the fall um like we have throughout the semester i think we might see we saw in chicago where there's a fake out on it and they just drop a bunch of tents and then bounce out on the encampment and make the cops pick up the stuff which is just wasting the resources of the police and kudos to them but that's where I see things moving forward right now. At least at Wayne State, they've also gone into hostile architecture at this time. The space where our encampment is, it, where our encampment was, is covered in brand new sprinklers. 
they have a circle of sprinklers around the spirit rock, which was the center of our encampment. And it's just getting sprayed routinely. Um, we have sprinklers that are hitting light posts or directly in light posts, no matter which way they move. And it's just meant to turn the campus into a hostile environment for an encampment to bring up again. And I know at you, Mitch, I've been passing through there the past few days, and it's a very similar setup where there's lots of cameras everywhere, particularly at walking level. There's cameras all over Diag now as well, and lots of security roaming. Yeah, I think it's been hard to me, hard for me to see the student movement slow down for summer because the filling is not slowing down and the planes and every other vehicle taking arms to Israel, they're not slowing down and it's hard to know what to do with that. But of course, it's not just people taking a breather. It's also people that had summer plans, trips abroad or other kinds of things that are summer jobs, whatever it may be. Like, there's a lot of reasons that people are less involved. And of course, the encampment took a lot of energy out of a lot of people. So I think that's part of it too. In line with that, I am hoping that our return to campuses is marked by efficiency and imagination to imagine what kinds of things we can do to really capture people's hearts and minds and really, like I said, make the regions uncomfortable in a way that means less labor for us and less risk as well. So that's tough. It's always a balance. Yeah. I'm not sure about the encampments returning. They've definitely, they're definitely concerned about that at the university, but of course they can't prepare for everything. And if they wanted to prepare for everything, a good starting place would be to look at their own history as a university, look at the movements that they now applaud, because a lot of times that's what we turn to, to figure out what to do now, right? The Black Action Movement, it had three waves at the University of Michigan, and at various times, they did just about everything that we've ever done. Yeah, we've got lots of ideas, and the university, we have a, they have a contracted security group that observes open areas for the university, and we heard from one of them that a university administrator told him that they were probably going to downsize staffing heading towards the fall because they believe that students are fickle and they'll just choose something else to do something around. And so of course that, I have no idea if that is true, but that really riled me up personally and got me thinking, like, absolutely not. We will come back with a vengeance. Israel isn't stopping anytime soon. And even if they did, the real dangerous thing for the Hasbara uh, at this point is that people know. Students know. Young people know. Young Jewish people know. Israel will never come back to this. Propaganda-wise, politically, they could stop the killing. They could stop the imprisoning. They could stop a whole lot of things today, and people would still say, no, this has to end. Sooner or later, they'll just get back to doing exactly what the settler colonial states require. Ethnic cleansing and apartheid, they're just things that you have to do if you want a settler colonial state on somebody else's land. And pretty soon, they'll just keep doing more things. And so I'm inspired that people know that people are well-educated despite what the news says about us. And I know that students will continue to come back on this issue. It's not just a since October 7th thing. This is a revitalization and a push and a movement that have been in the United States on college campuses for over 20 years. Yeah, hard to agree. I see you're off me, Giovanni. What's up? Yeah, no, you just mentioned something also about young Jews. In America, one of the biggest contradictions in the official narrative here is that 
much of these protests across the country are led by, by young Jewish American or so that right there fall in the face, the whole notion the whole propaganda of anti-Semitism just fall in the face because much of these movements are led by, by young Jews. Yeah, I don't, I, I think I'm with you, Levi. Piss off a young person and you, you're going to have a, a problem for a long time. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's always been in, in anti-war movements, the students who have have kept the fire going and I, I i'm with you and the hope and imagination that, that will continue and I, yeah my my last question is for you levi in that i know that you were a, a dear friend of aaron bushnell after bonding during air force boot camp and for many of us the veterans aaron's act really catalyzing our place as far as needing to speak up and say something and and have a voice and i'm curious around what do you think aaron yeah would have thought about the encampments or i know that he was very active in in unhoused communities and so what do you picture aaron's response to student in camp? Yeah, mostly I'm just sad that you can't be a part of it because there are so many aspects that I think would have meant a lot to him to be one of these outside agitator supporting uh, the community member. And so it is rough to see everything in some way. On my more mystical days, I feel like I feel like I'm able to be a continuation of what he would have done. I hope so. I don't think I'm doing as much, but just being able to meet all of these people. Yeah. Sometimes I think of it as carrying a piece of him and trying to help other people meet him through me. And yeah, at the encampment, the last day we were there, I spoke about him for quite a while and got to share stories and answer questions. And yeah, it's tough sometimes to meet people and think this person is so cool. And I met them because Aaron will never get to meet them. Cause I just don't, I just don't know how, how active I'd be involved in this movement if it weren't for him. I, I always hoped that, that I would be by now. Right. But I just never know. And so whenever I meet somebody, I think I wish there and can meet this person and so i just think hopefully i have some piece of him and that piece of him has mapped them through me yeah i think that he'd be incredibly inspired and motivated by it there's a part of me that thinks that the encampments would have been something to keep him going and keep him feeling like there was movement so that's hard too but we'll say i think he'd be right there alongside of us and that's where we need to be. There's so many people that feel incredibly hopeless. So many people thinking about doing something like he did. And you just have to show people the way. You have to show people, here's what we can do to get involved, to make a difference that doesn't involve ending your own life, that doesn't involve making sacrifices that you can never take back. Uh, you have to pour yourself into it in a way that keeps you alive. And I just hope that people continue to do that, particularly veterans and particularly active duty members. Aaron once told me that I, I was organizing a unionizing campaign and I told him something I had done, some letter I had written to the owners. And he was like, wow, I really look up to you. You're always standing up to authority in this way. I may talk a big game, but I would never do something like that. And obviously he did. He stood up to authority in a big way and made, made the Air Force look pretty bad, which is why you're seeing so many people, particularly in the Air Force, come out and say, the Air Force didn't say anything about Aaron Bushnell. I'm, I'm going to 
make them say something about it. I'm going to make this an issue for them. And that is something I'm really proud of. And I know that he would be because it is one thing to leave this world in that way. And it is actually a different thing. And at times a more difficult thing to stand up and then face the facts and then face the repression right from the Air Force. Get the LOCs and get the paperwork tries to punish you for standing up for what's right, for standing up for what you vowed to protect. But yeah, I just hope that people continue to learn our legacy. Um, Aaron, appreciate you, brother. I think that's a good place for us to wrap up today. Levi, Ro, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your time with us, your thoughts, your experiences on this terrible event that we're all witnessing live stream. Any last comments before we depart? Good to be with you. Thank you. Thanks for having us out here. All right. Thank you all for joining us today. I uh, hope to see you soon again. Take care. Money is tight these days for everyone. Penny pinching to make it through the month often doesn't give people the funds to contribute to a creator they support. So we consider it the highest honor that folks help us fund the podcast in any dollar amount they're able. Patreons is the main place to do that. In addition, any support we receive makes sure we can continue to provide our main episodes free for everyone. And for supporters who can donate $10 a month or more, they will be listed right here as an honorary producer, like these fine folks. Fahim's Everyone Dream, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Janet Hansen, Ren Jacob, and Helge Burke. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or please check out our store on Spreadshirt for some great Fortress merch. We're on Twitter and on Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time.